Hi. We have today a very, very interesting guest. His name is Steven Zipperstein, and he is one of the leading cultural historians of Eastern European Jewry. He is a professor of Stanford University and an author of many books. The last one that I am aware of is called Pogrom, Kishinev and the Tilt of History. This is the book. I have read it, and I highly, highly recommend everybody to go to Amazon and purchase it. You're going to enjoy it a lot, and you're going to learn a lot about Jewish history. It is, I agree with Steve, a pivotal moment in Jewish history, not only of Jews of Russia and their later Soviet Union, but also of American Jewry. So if you're interested in these things, go ahead and purchase it. This is a great book. And now we're going to talk a little bit about it. Steve, hi. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Um, why did you decide, I mean, there's many things in uh, uh, Jewish history of 20th century that you could focus on. Why did you decide to focus on pogrom in Kishinev? Um, it, it, the, it started, I started writing a different book. I mentioned that briefly at the beginning of this book. I uh, signed a contract with a trade publisher to write a cultural history of East European and Russian Jewry from the 18th century to the present. And then to just to organize the research, I subdivided the book into various slices, at least tentatively. And one of those slices was, was the Kishinev pogrom. And um, once I started digging and digging across the various languages, I came to recognize that if one better understood this, one understood so much about how Jews came to understand their past, how others came to understand Jews um, over the course of the last century and over the course and over the expanse of continents. And uh, so the work kept on deepening. And, um, and I also came to realize that I'd be able to tell, because of the vast amount of documentary material in Russian, Yiddish, Hebrew, other languages, I'd be able to tell an immeasurably more intimate story about the lives of Jews in Russia than I had previously in my other books. In some measure, because the pogrom ended up being so well documented by so many different hands. Um, um, so we end up knowing so much about the, even the, the, the homes of the, the, the victims and bystanders, their, their belongings, and um, that sense of intimacy um, drew me to the project along with its far-reaching ramifications. I, um, I was simply hooked, and eventually hooked, as I suspect we'll talk about a little bit later, once I discovered an array of archival material in various languages, some of which um, had never been seen before in Western private hands. What is the uh, most important point of interest in this whole story of Pogrom and Kishinev for American Jews? Uh, most, in, oh, uh, uh, most important, um, I mean, among the various um, themes that ended up intriguing me, and that I hope will intrigue others, Jews, and, uh, as well as, as non-Jews, is um, the way in which Jewish life in the last century clearly has been punctuated by tragedy. And in this book, I zero in on an event that defined Jewish tragedy, um, for reasons that are somewhat curious, we could talk about those later, um, to find Jewish tragedy before the Holocaust. And at the same time, um, an event that came to be um, mythologized, misunderstood by Jews and others. In other words, I think that 
one of the features of contemporary Jewish life is um, um, the notion that the entire Jewish past was catastrophe. Uh, and if indeed it was as catastrophic as some Jews assume, I suspect we wouldn't be here today. Um, at the same time, um, Jews tend to befuddle so many others be, by virtue of the way in which we seem so influential, and yet we claim to be so vulnerable. And so I wanted to take a real tragedy um, that was incredibly well documented to affirm that real tragedy exists, and at the same time, um, to remind Jews that, um, that to some extent we've transmuted our tragedies um, and transmuted the past. And so it's a reminder both to Jews and to those non-Jews who are befuddled by Jewish history. And so it's addressed to both at one at the same time. And I also tried to write a book that said some important things for historians, but that um, would be accessible to, to others, especially since the book is really a study of popular consciousness. And, um, and so it seemed all the more important to speak in such a way that was readily accessible. You, you said, if I understood correctly, transmuted? Yes. Meaning you believe that there's no possibility of pogroms in the United States? Well, let, let's leave the question aside. I don't, I don't know that pogroms in the United States are of immediate concern, but we can talk about that. Um, what I mean is that one of the curious features of this particular event is that it's both, as I argue in the book, perhaps the most well-documented single event in the Russian Jewish past, for reasons we can discuss, and also the most thoroughly mythologized. And um, so that um, the, uh, the, among the major lessons that end up being learned by Jews, especially in Palestine, eventually Israel, is that Jews engage in no self-defense. Um, the primary proof text that makes this case is, of course, Bial Chaim Nachman Bialik's famous poem, Bir HaRigan, the city of killing. Uh, and the fact is, is that Bialik, who spent five weeks in Kishnev, um, took copious notes um, after speaking with the victims and bystanders and documented um, um, extensive uh, self-defense. Um, Jews ended up de-emphasizing self-defense in the um, trials of pogroms, tr uh, trials of pogromists that ensued from over the course of some six months. And we have the transcripts. Um, the defendants argue that in fact Jews were too aggressive. That <laughs> It was the fault of Jews that there was a pogrom. The first day was simply a kind of holiday bacchanal, but Jews were so aggressive that non-Jews had to defend themselves. Um, and in many ways, Bialik's poem, of course, is the backdrop to the creation of the Haganah and eventually the Israeli army. So, so much of what ostensibly is known about this event is, um, is based on mythology, mythologies that themselves have had enormous impact on history. And you worked on this book, what, for 10 years? Uh, it's sometimes embarrassing to admit how long one works on a book. Have you, have you noticed that? But uh, <laughs> it was on and off. I, I did other things as well and started, as I, as I said before, another book. But it, um, there is some 10 books, 10 years, um, not 10 books, the last, but 10 years that stretched between my publication of my last book and this book. But I'm, um, I'm loath to say that I worked on it for 10 years. Let's get back to the issue of self-defense. As you say, Bialik raised the issue. In fact, two-thirds of his uh, poem is about how cowardly Jews are and how uh, lacking in the ability to defend, you know, uh, 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 our women are being raped and uh, we are sitting somewhere and just watching it and hoping what, that uh, we're not going to get hurt. That's what it is. And uh, you say that his own notes, Bialik's own notes, contradict it. Yeah, well, we have access to his notes. Um, the notes um, uh, written in Yiddish then, then uh, translated into Hebrew 
um, and eventually published years and years. They were sequestered in, in uh, Beit Bialik, in, in Bialik's archive in Tel Aviv, and only published um, the last quarter century. So uh, we know what it is he wrote down. We know what it is, what, 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 what uh, was reported in the various trials. Uh, we also know that in as much as the Kishna pogrom was a real surprise, and Kishnev was not a city with a um, strong, um, strong presence of Jewish socialists. It wasn't a city with factories. Hence, the Jewish socialist labor board was very weak there, a group that ended up be being at the helm of defense activity after Kishnev. There were relatively few Marxist Zionists who were also very active in uh, defending Jews later on in 1903, 1905, 06. Uh, but nonetheless, in the absence of these political groups or the weakness of these political groups, there, there were many instances of, of Jewish defense. At the same time, Bialik's poem, and I'm not sure that two thirds of it technically is devoted to um, the shameful behavior of Jews, but you're absolutely right when you note that the most powerful um, sections of the poem, without doubt, are devoted not to the humiliation and horror of rape per se, but of how, but the shameful behavior of Jewish males. Um, uh, Bialik, Bialik felt that humiliation personally all the more strongly, um, probably as a very distinguished Israeli literary scholar, Misha Gluzman has demonstrated, because at the very same time he was working on um, his, uh, his witness accounts of uh, pogrom um, victims. He was also writing an autobiography um, and, was, um, and recalled with special vividness and pain a childhood experience where he was abused by a cousin and probably conflated that experience with, um, with the experience of the women of, of Kishnev. Um, Bialik's poem is, um, is incredibly uh, photo, photo, photographic. Uh, it, I actually was able to use um, a copy of the map that Bialik himself used when he uh, walked um, through Kishnev. And, um, and you actually, to this day, and I don't know if you've, you've been there, could actually descend physically into the area that he describes as the epicenter of the pogrom, so-called Lower Kishnev. So much of what he describes um, it was uh, almost um, uh, uh, was almost akin to newspaper reports. Um, at the same time, I think he includes in the in the poem um, um, accounts of the shameful behavior of males that historians and Jewish journalists actually did not include in their accounts out of a sense that you don't attack a vulnerable people with data like this. Um, I was able to substantiate some of what Bialik wrote because as you'll remember in the book, I was also able to track down the papers of Michael David, who was a, a famous, then famous Irish radical and a journalist who was sent by the Hearst Press to write about the, the pogrom after it ended, and who wrote the first um, first book in a Western language. There was a best-selling book about the Jews of Russia, and I was able to see his notes in Trinity College Dublin, and he actually records the same thing that Bialik wrote, and yet doesn't include any of that in his book. And um, you know, it's a reminder that vulnerable people. Jews, African Americans, various vulnerable people at various moments in history tend to um, sequester fam shameful family secrets all the more assiduously. And um, I think Bialik may have felt since he was writing a poem as opposed to a piece of journalism, he was able to put this in. So Bialik's responses are complicated. We'll get to reaction of uh, uh, African Americans here in Springfield and in the United right. States later on. But I want to get back to reaction of Jews in Kishinev. Right. So, in your own assessment, uh, how do you assess it? Was it cowardly? I mean, a, a, a third of the city uh, uh, was Jewish. Maybe half. 
maybe uh, somewhere between a third and half. The statistics are unclear. So, and uh, a, a total of what? Uh, you say 49 people were killed? Yeah, 47 40. killed, two died later, soon afterwards of wounds incurred yeah. during the war. But I think uh, two of them were non Jews. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, there were, I think there were 49 Jews killed, some other, some other non-Jews killed. Yeah. Because some of them were killed during the pogrom, and some right. of them were call, killed by the Russian troops that came on the third day, right? No, not, the Russian troops never killed anyone in, when putting down the pogrom, no. So those that were killed, were they killed by uh, Jews defending themselves? No, the, the Jews, um, well, there were a number of incidents where uh, Jews sought to defend themselves. The, 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 the most concerted incident on the early morning of the second day um, didn't involve, didn't um, result in any Jews killed. It did result in Jews being arrested uh, and jailed along with the pogromists and then put on trial. Um, um, in the uh, in the, the summer and fall of 1903, but there were 49 Jews killed. 49 Jews killed. Now, uh, and, and, and and at least as many raped. The numbers there are unclear, and you sh rape tends to go undocumented. You mentioned, I think, 60 rapes or something. Uh, we have documentation from reports of rabbis of 40 rapes, but those include only the number of raped women who actually um, spoke to rabbis. Um, and we assume that there were others, perhaps many others who did not. And there was, what, uh, a dozen or so that uh, uh, were divorced by their husbands and a dozen or so that uh, whose marriage did not consummate because uh, they were raped. The, the statistics we have from David after speaking to a local rabbi is that about a dozen women were divorced as a result of the, uh, the rapes, yes. Be, beyond that, we don't know how many women uh, were rendered less marriageable or perceived as less marriageable because of it. Now, Rape is something very hard to document. If it wouldn't be for Bialik's uh, portrayal of Jews as cowardly and weak, uh, do you think that there would be any reaction similar to what actually was produced? I mean, by the way, uh, 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 he wrote it in Hebrew, right? He wrote it in Hebrew, but it was then translated by Vladimir Jabotinsky and, and changed in some ways into Russian. And the, the Russian translation was probably even more influential than the Hebrew. Jabotinsky's translation was more influential, of course, because yeah. people in Odessa, this is the main market for something like this. Uh, would have reacted to it differently than people, you know, in the same Kishinev. But not just Odessa. By, by 1905-1906, so many of the younger Jewish men and women were much more um, comfortable with Russian than with Yiddish. And, um, and uh, we know that, for example, from the number of books, periodicals, taken out of Jewish lending libraries, where the preponderance of books taken out in, in, in periodicals are in Russian and not either in Yiddish or, he, or, or Hebrew. So, um, and also Jabotinsky's Russian translation was, um, there were fewer um, biblical and midrashic allusions. It was more accessible in, in, in some ways than Bialik's own original. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, now, Let's uh, go from Russia to... Yeah, just, just, just return to your, your, your question, Alex, about if Bialik hadn't written the poem. It's an interesting question. The, much of the reason why the Kishnev pogrom becomes the Kishnev pogrom, and there are far more heinous attacks against Jews. I mean, 600 are killed on the streets of Odessa in 1905, in October 1905. Um, but some people say 850. Yeah, so they, um, I, mean, I mean, certainly between 1918 and 1921, um, uh, the, 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 the calculation now is close to 200,000 Jews are, 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 are killed um, and, um, and countless women raped. And yet the places where these atrocities occur tend to be remembered at best only by descendants. 
and don't enter into Jewish memory. What's different here is in some measure the institutionalization of memory. Kishnev becomes crucial to Zionists, to Jewish socialists, to territorialists, to in some ways even to the um, call for Jewish integration in America. It's the basic, it's the central theme of Israel Zangwill's play, The Melting Pot. And um, so in large measure, the institutionalization of this event ends up etching it into Jewish memory. And then there's the role of contingency, of accident, as I describe in the book. It's the location of Kishnev. Um, at the most poorest of all Russian borders, with the most bribable of authorities, right at, right at the border of Romania. The location in Kishnev, probably as a result of how porous the borders are, of the Zionist Movement's Correspondence Bureau, headed by a very decent man, Yakov Bernstein Kogan, who has international contacts to the press. And so he's able to um, um, utilize his contacts by sending um, um, about 100 or 200 telegrams on the end of the second day of the pogrom to newspapers throughout the Western world. Um, and the way in which the Times of London, for example, hears about the pogrom is uh, through uh, Jakob Bernstein Kogan. And we know that from copies of the telegram that they receive. And uh, so had the same events, even worse events, occurred a couple of hundred miles to the east, it wouldn't have been the Kishnev pogrom. Accident contingency um, is so much, a cru such a crucial feature of history. So if, you, if there wouldn't be Kishinev pogrom, there wouldn't be then reaction by Jews, and there wouldn't be loan to Japan by Jacob Schiff. <laughs> well, there, I mean, I don't know if that would be a loss of uh, uh, Russia in war with Japan, the first loss of major European power to Asian country? Yeah, I, I don't know if Jews were largely responsible for, for that, um, but certainly um, the Kishna pogrom and the ostensible proof that's garnered in the wake of the pogrom that the Russian government was responsible for it, the surfacing about a month after the pogrom of the so-called Pleve letter. Pleve was, of course, then Minister of Interior. He was really all but unknown before he became infamous. And he becomes infamous to Jews, radicals, and others, liberals throughout the Western world, because of this letter signed ostensibly by him, basically instructing the governor general not to put down the pogromists. This is, this is the proof, ostensibly, the proof that the Russian government um, sends out murderers to kill, plunder, and rape Jews. And that proof was a forgery. And, but it's widely believed. It's, I suspect, written by someone who truly, sincerely believes that if they had Pleva in the room, this is what he would say. The trouble is they don't. And so they were putting words in his mouth, but nonetheless putting words that were nonetheless accurate. But this has a direct bearing, we know, on um, uh, ensuring that Jewish immigration to the United States is relatively unrestricted. Um, uh, at a time, I mean, in 1902, uh, Chinese, uh, the immigra immigration of Chinese is, is re, the restrictions against Chinese immigration are, re, are affirmed in the United States. There's an anti-alien act in England. And so in many ways, the huge population of Jews in the United States, at least in some measure, is, is the byproduct of the belief in this forgery. Um, and um, so there perhaps is one of the most potent examples, among the most potent examples of the disjuncture between the what actually happens in Kishnev and um, the mythology that tumbles from it. Uh, but the mythology, as I suggested before, mythology makes history. This, this, yeah. Uh, there's so many questions that I want to <laughs> ask. But one question I want to ask, as long as we're on Pleven, 
is uh, the assessment that was provided not only to Pleva, but to the whole role of Russian central government in staging of pogroms that was, mm, uh, I think, your uh, teacher, uh, uh, Hans Rogers. Hans Rogers. Uh, a major role in uh, uh, changing, uh, following the established tradition of blaming the Russian government. Can you please say a few words in that? Yeah. And I, of course, I dedicate the book to Hans's memory. He's a very, very great historian. Um, and a very um, supremely rational German Jew who is, was one of the great historians of his time of irrationality. And um, just a curious interplay, just what we, we do with our lives. So, um, was he ever in Russia or Soviet Union? Well, um, he was, but uh, at the time, uh, in, for his generation and for mine, there were, there were incredible restrictions against archival research on anything Jewish. Um, archival research. There was no possibility no. of archival research. No. Anything. No. I, mean, I, wrote, I wrote my first book on the Jews of Odessa without ever even being on the streets of Odessa. I wasn't given permission. I was on some list. By the way, I have to say, some of the people, you know, my friends that read this book, I did not read this book, really, re they're from Odessa. They really, really like your book on Odessa. Thank, on you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the first, I first visited Odessa when I was teaching in Moscow and um, in 1993, so it was some years after the publication of a book. It was so strange to write a history of a city without being in the city. You um, did a good job. Thank you. Um, but uh, Hans, Hans's work, I'm trying to think back. I don't think uh, he's visited Russia, but he wasn't able to do any archival research. It was all based on published sources. Um, but as a very keen student of Russian conservatism and of the workings of the Russian government, he recognized rather early that there was a chasm between this notion that the Russian government was, um, and also as, as a student of the, the, muddled, the muddled nature of Russian policy. The um, autocracies are profoundly inconsistent when it comes to policy. So the notion that ended up being regnant in Russian Jewish historiography, in many ways etched onto it by Simon Dubnov, the, in many ways the dean of Russian Jewish historical writing, an extraordinary historian. The notion that there was a, a monolithic attitude toward Jews, and uh, it was enacted by the Russian government, and a Russian government that, um, among many other heinous policies, um, uh, organized pogroms, was, as Hans came to see, inconsistent with everything he knew about the workings of the Russian government. And so he came to it not as an expert in the internal workings of Jews, but a great expert in the internal workings of the government. And because of this, and coming to the topic a little bit from the outside, he was able to shed extraordinary light on it. And so, yes, uh, as I say in the book, all of us who work on these topics uh, stand on his shoulders. And, um, and he, um, um, so he was among the first influential historians who was able to document how, um, how inconceivable it was that the Russian government actually was what Jews assumed the Russian government to be. It wasn't only Jews who, misperceived the nature of the Russian government. And the imperial government had a vested interest in exaggerating its, its power um, because it held people in check. We know now that if we count the number of police in Russia relative to the number of police at, at the turn of the century in France, France had many more than Russia. But the assumption, the regnant assumption was that nothing of significance could happen in the regime without the Russian government's involvement, which ended up helping to sustain the imperial regime, which was by any standard um, a great autocratic success story. I mean, they exist up until 1917, and arguably without the First, um, without, uh, the first World War could have actually existed into the 1920s. And um, so, um, and to some extent, misperceptions about it help, help, help sustain it. Um, Hans Roger, 
uh, wrote a great um, summary uh, for the uh, book uh, edited by John Clear and Lombroso. Yes, superb, superb, superb summary. I remember, I remember reading it in manuscript. I think as a graduate student. Yeah. But uh, uh, there is only one or two lines given to uh, Russian government army for groans of 1914, 1915, 1916. Um, yes, I don't, I don't remember that specifically. I mean, it is true, and Hans points this out in his work, that by the time the First World War erupts, um, there are a not insignificant number of figures either in the government or near the government for whom the, um, the Jewish question is seen as central. And, um, figures who can perhaps be seen as nascent fascists. And um, in contrast to conservatives like Pleve, whose primary preoccupation was the sustenance of the regime, who certainly were anti-Semitic, who believed that the regime would be better without Jews, but that no radical solution was possible and that all one can do is containment. In contrast to the sorts of figures that Hans describes in a splendid essay on the Bayless affair, who are responsible for the affair, for whom the, um, a belief in the perniciousness of Jews. That is 1911, 1913, right? Right, with the trial actually in 1913. Um, for whom a belief in the perniciousness of Jews could possibly be the future organizing principle of the, an imperial regime with a weakened Tsar. People who were looking for an alternative to the power of the Romanovs, especially as Nicholas II, the last Romanov Tsar, ends up impressing um, a fewer and fewer, and, um, and who begin to actually formulate a notion, a notion that um, the jewelry is the central um, um, enemy of, of Russianness. You see echoes of this, alas, in that strange book by Solzhenitsyn that he writes late in his life. The, I mean, this notion that somehow Jews are of equal power in Imperial Russia to, um, to, the, to Russians, perhaps even, even more powerful. That- I not only Solzhenitsyn, you know, even before the First World War, they were saying we can't fight Germans and Jews at the same time. Right, and right. So, so, yes, uh -huh. yeah, so you're, you're, you're right. So these ideas begin to percolate at this time, begin to enter into official circles in a way that's new, radically new, and potentially very dangerous, and that has explosive implications um, in the wake of the Balkan Tap, 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 Right people in authority in Russian government, you, it, they cannot be dismissed that this is not Russian government. No, no, so I'm saying that this begins to permeate um, the Russian government um, um, in the last years of the Romanov regime. And um, it ends up being one of the main organizing principles, of course, of the so-called whites who are fighting the Bolsheviks and the various others who are fighting in the midst of the civil war where, um, the war ends up being seen by them in many ways as attack against Jewry. It's amazing to me, you mentioned whites. I mean, they hear this Asveg, Asvag, you know, um, the uh, Department of Propaganda was staffed with more than 2,000 people and they could not come up with anything other than kill the Jews to save Russia. Right, right, right. Yeah, they, 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 the Bolsheviks were more creative. And by the way, in your book, you mentioned, uh, I did not know that uh, uh, Khrushchevan, you know, the, the motivator, the, the, the agitator of Kishinev Pogrom, and who is the author of, as you say, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, the, the, of uh, um, what do you call it? Well, the first, the first um, he's the author, he's the publisher, and he's either the sole author or the joint author 
of the first version of what becomes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is also one of the byproducts of the Kishna pogrom. You say that he wrote introduction and comments? That's what he wrote, it is? He wrote a foreword, a very strange foreword and afterword, where he almost all but admits that it's a forgery. It's a, very strange, because he's... He was actually, a, a, I mean, he was obviously a rabid anti-Semite, a, a deeply disturbed man. Um, uh, uh, among the, the, the archival finds that I discovered while working on this book were his um, probably most embarrassing papers um, uh, um, that were found by a, um, a Kishinev, the, the city's name was changed, um, a Jewish journalist brought to Brookline and and given to me as I was finishing the the book. They're now um, they've now um, been placed at the Hoover Institution uh, at my university at Stanford. And um, uh, Khrushchevan is a very vivid stylist, uh, uh, many ways a superb writer. Was he uh, ethnic Russian or Moldovan? He's um, is he Serbian? I think the father is a Serbian. Um, um, lower nobleman, I think of Serbian birth. Many of the sort of arch anti-Semites come from sort of what would be in a Russian context, mongrel background. And, um, and uh, he is certainly one. Uh, his, his, the family's money is now uh, gone. There's evidence, uh, astonishing evidence, that uh, his mother dies young, we know that and that he was raised by a stepmother who was born Jewish. Um, he, um, I, I talk about that in, in, in my book. Um, his, uh, the papers I found, uh, he dies very young at the age of 49 of cancer, childless. He's, Two years, uh, uh, four year, 19, 1909, you said? In 1909, yeah. And um, he, um, uh, he uh, among the papers I, I discovered, was his adolescent uh, diary, and which uh, had material that was all the more shocking since Khrushchevan, as you know, in uh, the region he comes from, is now seen as a great hero of what's called Christian socialism, anti-liberalism, anti-capitalism, anti-Semitism, homophobia. And um, as he acknowledges in his diary, He's, um, he's having sex with a Cossack um, um, uh, male, and um, he wishes he was born a lady. Uh, he says this explicitly, and, um, and he's uh, then uh, made into what he becomes. He, he, he's childless. Unsurprisingly, he leaves his papers with a, uh, a nephew who's very devoted to him. The nephew dies in an insane asylum, and, um, and, and during the implosion of what was the Soviet Union, these papers end up in the hands of a Jewish journalist who then brings them to the States, who gives them to me. And, um, uh, and um, so uh, among the uh, odd oddities in this archive uh, is evidence that Khrushchevan, who at the time was seen by Jews as among the best connected most influential um, and, and, and wealthiest of anti-Semites in Imperial Russia is, is bankrupt. He's, uh, there are notes from bailiffs assessing his, uh, the, val the, kind of the value of his desk. We know the, the wood that his, desks is, is, his desk is made out of, the, the wood that his bookshelves are made out of because they're being assessed for, for auction. And um, um, he's, uh, he's penniless. And, uh, and um, so it's just a, just a reminder of the interplay between reality and, uh, and mythology once one begins to dig into life. But in traveling through Moldova, especially uh, the Dniester Republic, which is a portion of Moldova that is captured by Russians, you know, and... Right. Uh, you described, uh, I, I thought that they were all sort of like communists, Stalinists, and things like this. But what you point in your book, that people, the Russians, ethnic Russians there in that portion of Moldova that they cut off from Moldova, 
Right. Uh, they actually are followers, or some of them, followers of this Khrushchevan. I mean, yeah, influenced. I mean, Khrushchevan in that in that part of eastern Moldova, um, um, Khrushchevan is a hero, and uh, I. Um, I use that's precisely because he was against Jews. That's why he is here. Well, uh, that helps. <laughs> I mean, Jews as a as exemplifying all all that's wrong in the world, um, acquisitive liberal liberalism, um, awful capitalism, um, lack of integral community, and so. Um, Yes, and so his... But that portion of Moldova, that portion of Russian Moldova, is governed by a bunch of really, really wealthy billionaires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I didn't visit. I, there, I promised my wife that I wouldn't because you can't, it's not clear how you get in and out. But as I mentioned in the book, I was in, um, in correspondence with the assistant for minister of that place. Um, who wrote um, um, the only recently sustained biographical work on Khrushchevan uh, and makes it clear that in his region, Khrushchevan is a major hero and, uh, and who accepts um, every single anti-Semitic canard about Khrushchevan, about the pogrom, the, the protocols were written by Jews <laughs> who somehow persuaded Khrushchevan to, to publish them, how that remains unclear. Yeah, so the, um, I mean, the story simply had so many different aspects. It was, just going back to your very, very first question, just impossible not to write. And um, also it, it had been written in various ways, it had been written by, his, to some extent, by historians of Russia, uh, by historians of, 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 of Jews, but never by anyone who could cross a, uh, the various cultural and linguistic barriers. And, and, and to tell the story, you really, fully, you have to. For Americans, right? Tell the story for Americans. Or, or even for a Jew from Vinitsa like, like you. Well, it is interesting, yeah. I think I can read a little bit in English, not much, but in any case, uh, getting back to America. Yes. Um, as you describe in this book, the effect of, uh, that is the question again, you know, but you say that the effect of pogrom, uh, 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 pogrom in Kishinev played major role in uh, uh, leading to creation of National Association of Colored People in America. In yeah. So, yeah, so that, that was um, uh, something that I pieced together at the very end. And uh, while there were a number of surprises for me in this book, that perhaps was the greatest surprise. So what I discovered was that um, the enormous um, impact that the Kishnev pogrom ends up having uh, it, partly because of the Hearst Press, um, uh, Hearst himself is, tell me if this sounds similar to anyone in present day America, uh, enormously rich, enormously ambitious, um, willing to cut all kinds of corners. Um, he's, uh, he's already in Congress. He's thinking about running for the Democratic um, um, a presidential ticket or perhaps a, for, to be the governor of New York. He's courting Jews who are demographically important already in New York. And he makes the Kishnov and he, he makes the Kishnev pogrom into a cause celeb. Um, sends Michael Davitt there, sends money there. Um, it, it's, uh, it's one of the first items of foreign news in his newspapers, which really are more akin to the National Enquirer um, than to any kind of newspaper that we would recognize uh, today, at a time when objectivity at news wasn't taken seriously. We may return to that phase in the United States at some point. And um, so um, he, along with others, certainly the Yiddish press, um, ends up galvanizing around the Kishnev, Kishnev pogrom. It ends up having enormous impact. Theodore Roosevelt condemns it. Booker T. Washington, the leading African-American of the time, condemns it also at a time when lynchings have very little visibility. 
Um, um, the Booker T. Washington uh, is, is very um, uneasy about condemning lynchings. Lynchings tend to be discussed as, in large measure, the fault of the victims themselves. Um, uh, 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 African-American sexual appetite, um, their, the connection that African-Americans have with various party bosses, um, um, economic competition from blacks, etc. To some extent, the discussion about lynching in America is typologically very similar to the way in which pogroms are described by Russian anti-Semites and other Russians. It's always the fault of Jews. Uh, rapacious uh, economic activity by Jews, political radicalism, there are too many Jews, there are too few Jews, whatever. It's always, it's usually blamed on Jews in the similar ways that lynchings are blamed on, on blacks. And so in the wake of this enormous hubbub about um, the Kishna pogrom, um, a good many of sort of local, um, privately owned African-American newspapers, and I ended up um, digging these up and reading them, end up asking the question, why is it that there's so much attention to pogroms and no attention to lynchings? And this in and of itself doesn't lead to um, the creation of a, an organization like the NAACP, but it, um, it does in the wake of the pogroms of 1905, 1906. And it does largely because of a Jewish woman who's um, married to William English Walling, who becomes the first chair of what eventually becomes the NAACP. Its original name is somewhat different. And um, he's, they've traveled in Russia uh, for two years. They returned to the United States in 1908. And in 1908, there's the Springfield riot, which they cover. And- um, was uh, Starsky, uh, uh, Starsky, uh, uh, Stransky was a Russian Jew, right? Well, to, uh, Strunsky, was the um, was born there, raised in San Francisco. The family eventually moves to New York. She is a political radical. Studies at Stanford. Uh, is a lover of uh, Jack London's. Co-authors a book with him, um, and um, fluent in Russian and Yiddish. Uh, eventually marries uh, William English Walling. Helps him with his research, and um, they return to the United States and and are visiting Chicago. Just when the Springfield riot breaks out, they go to they go to Springfield to cover it, and then um, begin to speak about Walling's book, a book called Russia's Message, which was the main book capturing the um, teachings of Russian radicals um, in the English language before John Reed's book, Ten Days That Shook the World. John Reed mentions um, um, Walling's book in in the introduction to his book. And um, while, while speaking about um, um, uh, pogroms uh, in the midst of the, um, the revolution of 1905, 1906 on the stage of uh, Cooper Union, Strunsky herself, just out of almost nowhere, says, well, as bad as pogroms are, lynchings are worse. And um, in, the program ends and a series of meetings then ensue um, that culminate in a meeting in their own apartment in New York City, where what eventually becomes the NAACP is created. So it, it's um, interesting that you would say something like this, because yeah, those pogroms of 1905-1906, more than three and a half thousand Jews were murdered. Right, right. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that she's factually correct, but it has a, um, it's, um, it, it's, it's an example of what's what would be called today intersectionality. And um, and um, and ends up being politically potent and effective, and um, and inspires the eventually the creation of an institution um, that um, that begins to really put lynching on the agenda of American political life. And from your book, what I see about her is that actually she did not want to emphasize specifically Jewish suffering. Yeah, she's, you know, she's a, um, a radical of her time and place. And so um, she's both moved by Jewish suffering and she, she writes very movingly about a uh, pogrom in, um, was it um, uh, uh, Minsk, I think in 1906, um, not in Gomel, I think in Minsk actually. 
And, um, but she, she writes a, um, a manuscript called um, Revolutionary Lives, which is never published. And the only radical life that she somewhat disparages is um, of um, uh, the, uh, the Bundes Mark Lieber and can't quite understand why he remains so fixated on the suffering of Jews when one should be fixated uh, more honestly on the suffering of others. Um, so so um, taking advantage, making use of Jewish suffering in order to help somebody else. Or, well, or, I mean, she, she's, a, she's a universalist. And, and the Bund itself, of course, is torn on some level. But between Bund, Bund had the same idea with regard to Jews as well. You know, the Bund, the Bund is, is, is um, it, it remains a debate to what extent the Bund, um, though speaking in universalistic terms, is profoundly, deeply committed to the Jewish street. And, um, and so... Um, um, I didn't say they were, but many other members did not want to see themselves that way. Well, uh, I think they eventually, or many of them do. And um, look, Zionism also, in many ways, is torn from the outset by uh, between universalistic aspirations and particularistic ones. The, the desire on the part of many Zionists to create a state is to create a state like other states. I mean, look at Herzl's Alton Island. And, um, and um, so you care about Jews um, and what, you, what you're hoping most of all is that Jews could be remade into something else. And it's not only a Central European Jew like Herzl who believes this. I mean, live not to live but not, um, to build and to be rebuilt, to have one's character rebuilt one's internal workings rebuilt is one of the central notions of Russian, Russian, Russian Zionism too. Actually, uh, we could talk a lot about, uh, uh, about this, but I want to uh, 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 get back a little bit to, uh, I mean, the American part of the story is very, very interesting and, you know, people will be glad that they will read about it uh, in your book. But I want to go back to the culpability of the Russian government. I mean, uh, we go back, uh, first of all, uh, 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 Hans Rogers' book on the reforms of 19th century in Russia, fantastic, simply fantastic uh, thing. And uh, uh, maybe I was thinking maybe that led him to basically, I do not know if he just wanted I do not want to say white was, but just simply put the whole thing in the proper fact-based ground. Uh, I don't even know. He's not, he's not whitewashing. The motive, huh? No, he's not whitewashing at all. He's he's trying to understand. This is what 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 it is we do. We as historians. I mean, in some ways, in my work, I'm actually acknowledging um, some of the conclusions that anti-Semites draw from the Kishnev pogrom, that Jews misconstrued what happened, um, based their assumptions on a forgery that wasn't accurate, took advantage of it in order to ensure relatively unrestricted immigration to the United States, um, um, discredited the Russian regime so that it ends up being discredited in the, in the eyes of liberals and moderates in Russia and elsewhere, some of that argument is, is, is in retrospect accurate. I say that not because I have any sympathy for Russian anti-Semites, but, 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 but some of their conclusions there. But before 1903, more. before 1903, there was pogrom in 1902 in Chestakhova, which he played a big role. And before that, there was 20 years of these temporary laws, made temporary laws of, nine, uh, of 1882 where the government basically sided with pogromers of 1981, 1983, and told Jews that you are exploiters and they, you're no good nicks and get out of here. So the, I mean, the chance to have a, a pogrom of 1902 ends up not actually having all that much visibility in large measure 
because radicals are embarrassed by it because it's largely the work of workers. And, um, and so it's the wrong people who are the pogromists. And yeah, well, the revolutionaries yeah. and the Rodniks yeah. applauded the fact that the workers were killing Jews. Well, that, that, was, well, that was earlier in 1881, 1882. They're more ambivalent by Chenstokhova. Uh, they're actually quite embarrassed. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, 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 did not, I meant 1882. I did not mean right. uh, 1902. Yeah. Um, look, the, what Hans argues, and I think persuasively, and most of us who, who study Russian Jewish history um, were, have been persuaded by Hans, uh, including John Clear, who wrote a very good book on the pogroms of 1881, 1882, with the use of archival material that was inaccessible to Hans when he did his work. Um, the, um, there's no doubt that the Russian government, that it was the, the rare Russian official who did not dislike Jews, um, that the general consensus with regard to Russian officialdom was that Jews had an insidious impact, that the Pale of Settlement was in large measure um, consolidated, and this is one of Hans's major arguments, consolidated in order to protect uh, Russians in the interior from, uh, from Jews leaving regions that were the, by and large the non-Jews except in the cities were Poles, Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians uh, that the government was less preoccupied with. Uh, th there's, that's indisputable. But um, that, that does not mean that the Russian government, which feared urban and especially rural unrest more than anything else, that does not mean that the Russian government was then responsible for fomenting urban unrest. Uh, there's been superb work I cite some of it, for example, by William Fuller, on the um, the, the nature of, uh, of of the Russian Russian army and the policies of the Russian government, the the attitude of the Russian army toward putting down civil disorder. And the Russian army was deeply ambivalent um, about about being engaged in police work, and um, and 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 typically resistant to to be engaging in police work. And so, um, which was to, to a large extent why the you Russian mean, government work in stopping pogromers. It's police work. Most, as you probably know, most riots were not anti-Jewish riots. They were hunger riots. They were rural riots. They were peasant riots. And the Russian army was as ambivalent and resistant to being engaged in putting down these as it was in putting down anti-Jewish riots. So- the Cossacks did not have any problem with it. That's what they were there for. The, the um, by and large, the, the Cossacks who end up quite rightly um, dominating the Jewish imagination um, 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 are Jew, are, are, and at times, of course, Cossacks actually defend Jews from, from pogroms. Chaim um, uh, Brenner writes about this in, um, in, in, in letters to uh, either a lover or his parents um, in 19, 1905, um, the um, uh, Cossacks and other Russian, and uh, along with Russian authorities um, on the ground, certainly are involved in the, um, in the tumult that surrounds the constitutional crisis of 1905, 1906. But that does not mean that the, the central authorities in the Russian government had a plan. Long that you call it constitutional crisis. Normally, it's called first Russian revolution. Well, it doesn't work out all that well. So it's, um, I called it a constitutional crisis in this context because the resistance to it, the horror um, of, on the part of those who are, 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 are terrified by what's happening, um, is because they see the um, efforts of Jews and others to foist onto the Romanovs constitutional restrictions. And, um, and in the midst of that turmoil, certainly local authorities um, are, are involved in attacking Jews. And um, so there's no whitewashing here. There's no whitewashing of the depth of anti-Semitism. In fact, let me just end with this. In some ways, the argument that the Russian government was largely responsible itself um, served at the time to exonerate the Russian people. 
it served to, to leave the impression that in the absence of conniving authorities, the Russian people themselves, uh, good people, gentle people, would not engage in this violence, that the problem was not as deep and fundamental as indeed we learned that it, that it was. And um, so um, the end result, the teaching, the end result of the notion that the Russian government was responsible, in the end itself is an exercise, one could say, of whitewashing. This is a very, very good point. I like it. And let me just follow up on this one. So if this is the people who are responsible, then in your opinion, what were the driving forces of these people and what is propelling them? Because I have to tell you this, although right now in Russia, as you well know, um, Putin is not anti-Semitic in any way, although there are some uh, things that could be considered interesting. Uh, the people themselves are just waiting to explode with the uh, anti-Jewish uh, rage. I mean, we just saw it on the basis of this uh, IL-20 that was shut down in uh, Syria yeah. and the reaction on Russian TV. So if, you, if I ask you, at that time, in 1903, uh, what uh, drove the Russian, I do not know, masses or whatever you call it, people, or whatever you call it, you know, uh, grassroots, uh, uh, with the idea of Jew hatred? Look, um, not 900, including some Jews, were arrested uh, in a city of 110,000. Um, many interviewed by Michael David, whether sincerely or not, after the pogrom, say that they abhorred the violence even though they disliked Jews. Um, by and large, attacks of this sort including accusations of ritual murder and other accusations against Jews, surface only once they're uh, embraced by authorities, not necessarily governmental authorities. In this particular instance, the conclusion that I suggest in my book is that this is a pogrom fermented by Khrushchevan and the people around his newspaper, Bessarabets. And uh, people who were seen, Khrushchevan at the time, is seen as a leading intellectual in, um, in Bessarabia. And, um, and the, the organization that was personally, personally uh, patronized by Tsar Nicholas II. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean he, um, um, uh, uh, he, I, I don't know to what extent he was informed of it, we know that he does not take the protocols once they're published seriously. Um, the, um, the crucial actors here um, are this, is the circle around Khrushchevan and, um, and their newspaper, the only newspaper, of, uh, only real newspaper in the region um, that um, is in the midst of accusing Jews of all sorts of things in the wake of an ostensible ritual murder. Uh, it's proven that Jews have nothing to do with it, but nonetheless, Khrushchevan continues to stoke the fire. Um, the, um, the, the, it, it, it seems to me that circle is responsible for the pogrom at the same time that there's outsized violence and often profoundly outsized violence uh, an interplay between f familiarity and ferocity of the sort that Jan Gross so brilliantly documents in his book on um, his book Neighbors uh, about Poles and the Holocaust. Um, we also find a good many instances, as I describe in the book, of Jews running into the homes of Gentiles, Gentile neighbors, fully expecting to be protected and indeed being protected. So, um, the, the conclusions one could draw regarding Jewish, non-Jewish um, relationships before the pogrom or during the pogrom are complicated. And, um, you know, historians, rather than in contrast to, to political scientists, were somewhat hesitant about drawing theorems uh, about events, um, but rather painting things almost similar in detail to the way in which novelists paint things, just with the use of different sources. And um, so uh, there's evidence of enormous enmity 
and of, of, uh, of a spark that is ignited suddenly and ferociously and violently, and of also um, a considerable friendship between Jews and non-Jews, uh, a complex story, but a story that underlines the importance um, and the, the danger of figures um, of authority um, giving license to, to hatred. And that story might have some contemporary relevance in um, today's United States since the last election. And, um, and perhaps we should end there. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you, Alex. Steve, it's my pleasure to hear this conversation with you. I know that we could hear, at least I could have talked to you for many, many more hours, but our time is limited. <laughs> and I thank you once again for coming to our Chicago Jewish Cafe. And I hope that it's not going to be the last time. I hope that you're going to write many more books as good as this one. Thank you very much. As they say in China, Zai Gizin. Zai Bye-bye.